your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Sox Machine Live. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, alongside the Sox Machine beat reporter, James Fegan, and the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It is Jim Margulis, as we are streaming live on Thursday, March 21st, 2024. And for those listening to the podcast version of this, the audio only, thank you as always for listening. And for those watching on YouTube.com slash Sox Machine or on Twitter, thank you so much for joining us. In this episode of Sox Machine Live, eventually, I promise you, we will get to the White Sox preview of the 2024 season for the catchers and starting pitchers. We have some idea on how the White Sox starting pitcher rotation is going to start 2024. We firmly know who are going to be the catchers, but we'll also talk about food days that happened today for the Chicago White Sox. But as we are a week away from opening day, and we just saw the two-game series in Korea between the Padres and Dodgers, in which the team split those two games, so they both come back home one and one to start the season. We have chaos, uh, and that might be an understatement. A, a week before opening day, and of course, a side note: we'll preview catchers and starting pitchers, and it all starts with Shohei Otani. And if you have been under a rock the last couple of days or you've been focusing too much on college basketball. Shohei Otani's translator, Ipe Mizuhara, who's shown in this photo for those that are watching the live stream, and he's been Shohei's translator and been by his side ever since he's joined the Angels, got into a huge amount of gambling debt with a bookmaker in California, and sports betting is illegal in California. So this bookmaker is under federal investigation and while under federal investigation, ESPN and their reporters found out that there are wire transfers from Shohei Otani to this bookmaker. And supposedly it is to pay off the four and a half million dollar gambling debt that Shohei Otani's translator has racked up over an undisclosed amount of time. But now the latest report is that Shohei Otani's representatives are proclaiming that there's theft involved. That without Otani's knowledge, the transfer of four and a half billion dollars of his personal money has gone to this bookmaker. And Jim, I know you've always been skeptical about Major League Baseball's close relationship, especially with sports betting open up across the country. It's now legal in 40 of the 50 states in the country. And especially since we cover the White Sox and you are such a history of the organization, we are frequently reminded of the 1919 White Sox. And out of all the players of Major League Baseball, I cannot imagine a grander scandal when it comes to gambling than Shohei Otani being involved. So what are your initial thoughts about hearing this particular news. I'm really confused just by the two stories and how they seem to have one plan and then ditch that plan for another line of messaging uh, right as the story was breaking, you know, whether it was Otani paying off gambling debts and then, you know, maybe realizing like, oh, that might be illegal for me to pay off illegal gambling debts, even if they're not my gambling debts. So now we're going to say theft. I mean, that's kind of what it seems like so far. Uh, Craig Calcaterra did a good job breaking it down in his newsletter in terms mm -hmm. of like three outcomes and like the third outcome would be that oh, it, they're Otani's gambling debts and he's using the interpreter as like a, uh, um, you know, just somebody to throw under the bus and that seems like the least likely. But yeah, it's, you, you're kind of seeing like this drip, drip, drip in terms of like other sports, like especially was it the Alabama baseball one with the yes. world's dumbest <laughs> betters, you know, talking about like, I... <laughs> let me place this bet. I have inside information. Like you know, they're screaming that at the, at the window basically. And uh, just they're hitting like the uh, button underneath the desk to like sound the alarm to like, Hey, this is uh, some legals going on here. Uh, so like you're seeing this around different sports that even if like the players involved are not, or coaches involved uh, executives involved are not like the ones directly placing the bets. 
they have idiots in their orbit that can easily like just do just as much damage uh, when it comes to like, you know, this kind of um, either tangling people who should be, you know, maintaining their integrity uh, in competition or, you know, hopefully not worse, but like that's with how pervasive gambling is like, it just invites a whole lot more people into making a mess of what was like a nice contained atmosphere. Like sports gambling scandals were like, you know, kind of left for, you know, minor sports, especially like overseas. Like I think, uh, you know, Asia had one with tennis, uh, you know, just smaller sports, more individually based to where like only one person, it only takes one person to screw it up uh, versus now, you know, when it gets teams involved and you have way more people involved, like you can just, it invites the possibility of just having more people who can, you know, either bet stupidly or bet illegally and compromise a whole bunch of people who uh, should not be compromised. James, is this ever this topic of gambling sports gambling ever talked about within the white Sox clubhouse and, like the concerns or the pitfalls for the particular players. And I mean, because in, in the state of Illinois, in Chicago especially, you have multiple books that you could place bets with legally. Uh, certainly in terms of like the like verbal abuse they get on social media that they view that as spiked by gambling and fans and sports. <laughs> uh, I've been showed it type of stuff, venom they get that like gets personal towards like their significant others, even like after like five run five innings three runs allowed kind of stuff like that so um i think that's been part of their life uh for a while and i think gambling only kind of raises the stakes and the volume of it but uh to kind of jump off jim's point i think what's so chilling about this is that um this is you know what the probably as much as this is the most like famous figure in the sport this is like easily the most buttoned up and image conscious uh, uh guy in the sport so for him to have kind of like cracks in his camp where this sort of scandal can happen like I, I i'm sure his affairs are being like handled a lot more tightly than like the average like quad a reliever uh who doesn't have nearly the reason to not engage in this as uh, as otani would so i think that's what's really concerning about like the integrity sport going forward beyond just like even the specific case no that that is a good point james because we just learned that Joe got married and we just learned who his wife is, and you saw her during opening day in the, the opening series in Korea. And again, right now, the latest from ESPN is that Otani's legal representation is claiming theft, that the translator, Ipe, had banking information and was able to place these large wire transfers, like... So we bought our house three years ago, and my wife initiated the wire transfer for our house. We put down 20%, which was almost $100,000. And her and I were sweating the entire time for this amount of money to be transferred to the bank to process our down payment for the it's house. It's a terrifying chip. few hours. It is. To do this multiple times, like back to the story and the analysis from Craig Calcaterra that you mentioned, Jim, how does nobody within Shohei's team see this? Like, does the, does the floor of spending not meet $500,000? Or are there just so many transactions going in and out? It's like the, the office space, uh, Superman plot of just like, Oh, if you, uh, just mask a small sum and, you know, uh, thousands of transactions every day, like you don't notice it. Maybe he's got a lot of money going in and out and just all of a sudden, like you can sneak a little bit of garbage in here and there, <laughs> except in Otani scale uh, a little bit is yeah. Uh, who knows? Like a hundred thousand here, 500,000 there, 1.1 million there. Like, uh, yeah, it's, you know, there are a lot that we don't understand when it comes to just like the professional athlete lifestyle and like code of conduct. And when it, now you're, now you're adding like mega wealth into the equation, which like, you know, mm -hmm. standard ball player wealth. Like I remember uh, when you talked to Evan Marshall and, you know, he was you yeah. know, making a good salary, but like, you know, he was about to make his first million uh, four years in and like that I can kind of, I'm not, I'm not making a million, but I know like if my career ended at 30, I'd be thinking about like how to, you know, nurse that million dollars for as long as you can. So I kind of understand like the economic force underneath like a first year arb salary, just because like, if you have to make that last as long as possible, like I 
you know, some saving strategies apply. But when it comes to a guy who just signed a $700 million contract, which is even if it's like $460 million, even if it's deferred, all the endorsement money he's getting and so on and so forth, it's just probably like now you're entering that world of the mega rich to where like adds another complicating factor of just like what do their you know, just their their statements look like at the end of a month in terms of like lump sums, you know, a volume going in and out. So yeah, that's that's one I can't quite uh, wrap my head around. The the most recent like ESPN report had the note that or the claim from Otani's camp that part of the reason they couldn't figure out what Otani knew and how involved he was is that they were interviewing him through ePay, and thus the answers were unreliable, and so thus the claim that Otani first found out from Ipe like addressing the team saying he has a big gambling problem, which like, it's a very unfortunate story and it's a lot of concern, but it's a real like curve. The enthusiasm music starts playing <laughs> moment as he's addressing the team potentially and Otani is putting this together. Mm. Well, it reminds me of like when Joey Coro was translating for Manny Ramirez and just like the answers, like there would just be a couple of reporters like, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> they wouldn't tell you what he was saying, but like, that's not it. Yeah, there are a lot of it's like that from the Bartolo Cologne era. <laughs> we got this comment in our YouTube live chat from Lucky Spag. Four and a half million isn't anything when you spend twenty. How do you spend twenty two million from a football team without somebody noticing it? And that's uh, it. Employ the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, laundering twenty two million from the organization and putting it through draft kits. So that's a good point. We've seen much larger, but. He's going to prison. The Chicago White Sox would notice twenty two million oh, yeah. missing. I assure the you. White Sox would probably notice twenty two thousand dollars missing. Uh well, except for that uh ticket fraud scheme and those people went to That's jail as well. Uh but yeah, like I, I'm I'm curious on how this story ends. Uh Ipe needs to get a good lawyer, because I think he is going to jail, uh, no matter how this works out. But for Otani, yeah, he's got he has to tread carefully, as Calcaterra mentions. Even if he was trying to be a good friend, and couldn't trust giving his friend the money because who knows what they'll do with that money. But paying off this bookmaker directly, that breaks like the cardinal sin of rules, Jim, for Major League Baseball. And it raises the question of like, how does Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, handle Shohei Otani? with the suspension for breaking these two rules of, again, the greatest Cardinal sin in baseball, which is betting on the game all the way back from the 1919 Chicago White Sox. So it'll be interesting to see and how Commissioner Rob Manfred handles that. Uh, but he doesn't have much of a counterparty because what the hell is going on with the Players Association? Again, a week away, so the biggest player in the sport has this gambling thing going on and there's a mutiny within the players association. So there's Bruce Mayer, who's the current uh, deputy director of the players association. He was the lead negotiator for the players association with the most recent collective bargain agreement. And then there's Harry Marino, which Harry Marino helped the minor leaguers get represented and get a bit part of the players association. And James, maybe you can provide a little bit more clarity on, on how this works between the players and especially like team leaders, because it was Lucas Giolito for the Chicago White Sox before he got traded. He was the player rep for the White Sox. He was actually part of that eight player executive committee that unanimously voted against the new CBA, but they were overruled by everybody else in the Players Association. And we're learning from The Athletic and also Jeff Passan of ESPN. In the last couple of days, players throughout Major League Baseball are having these emergency meetings to discuss just not only ousting Bruce Mayer, but they may want to remove Tony Clark, who is the director of the Players Association. So that would mean the Players Association would have brand new leadership. And again, we're a week away from opening day. So can you provide a little bit more insight of what you have learned as a beat reporter over the years, talking to various player reps for the Chicago White Sox and like, how did this process work for the player's perspective? Um, in what sense, I guess. Like if they're having these emergency meetings right now, like was Lucas the one that had the meeting and then he would just translate it back to everybody in the clubhouse of what was going on? Yeah. They would have like a group chat and they really shared the function a lot. Like, um, 
we were talking to you know Sox people today. They were talking about how Andrew Vaughn was kind of sharing the the load a little bit last season with him. Um, so you know that would make Vaughn a you know likely candidate. We're trying to figure out who the union rep is now. Um, I, like during the lockout, Aaron Bummer was like took on a, like a bigger role. Uh, was kind of sharing information from like the negotiations. Liam Hendricks was involved a little bit. So like there's one union rep. And like his job is to basically stay engaged and try to keep like other players informed rather than all of them having to attend meetings or all of them having to like know what's going on at any time. Uh, the level of engagement can really vary by a lot. And, you know, some guys are engaged enough that they pitch in quite often. And some guys like we talked to Larry Garcia before he signed for the day before the lockout. And he famously said, there's a lockout coming. Larry Garcia <laughs> said that? So, uh, yeah, <laughs> we said like, was there an urgency to get this done? Because he was interviewing like three hours before it became official, and he was like, "Why? What's happened?" No way! Come on, <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember this? I didn't hear this story. Yeah, so the level of engagement can, can vary a little bit. <laughs> so Larry Garcia was four hours away from not getting that deal, and maybe the White Sox during the lockout. I mean, I bet it's. Maybe his agent knew that he was, the lockout was coming, but <laughs> it didn't mean fun to Larry. <laughs> That's what I'm, okay. All right. That was the day after my son was born, so I, I'm uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm free from following exactly what Garcia was thinking. <laughs> Honey, look at Larry. <laughs> uh, so Jim, what do you make sense of this? Like again, it is a mutiny right now between the players and the leaders of the players' association. I, I kind of feel like they're looking to chop someone's head off after what happened in this off season. And I can understand the players not being very happy and how this off season transpired, but this collective bargaining agreement is through the 2026 season. So are they going to do this every single year? It, it just, I, I it suddenly displays from unified leadership, unified union to, not anymore. Just fire everywhere. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, we'd been talking a lot about, like, the owners having cracks in the ranks based on, like, you know, just the uh, profligate spending up top and then, like, the, you know, really penny pinching on the bottom and complaints about revenue sharing money not being spent. Uh, the, you know, huge disparity, perhaps, in, um, you know, RSN money or whatever happens with RSNs. So, you know, there's a lot of focus on that or a lot of natural cracks forming and complaints. But, yeah, this kind of came out of nowhere. And, when I saw the, you know, the, the revolt uh, starting to uh, foment, like I, I wondered if it was a case of just like a lot of anti Scott Boris sentiments, like, you know, maybe it just, you know, he's obviously a popular agent because like a lot of star players are hired by him, but he does gum up the market. Sometimes really slows it up when you're waiting for like the traditional, top dollar player to sign and set the market downstream and such. And like, you know, when you see the, his markets drag into uh, February and March, uh, you know, it's a case of like, maybe just some players get impatient or angry. So maybe they're waiting for like a moment of weakness to try to, um, you know, if they felt like, you know, Meyer or Clark were, you know, too influenced by Boris to maybe try to uh, diminish some of that influence, but they just had to wait for like a, you know, not just a winter where he waited longer than anybody would have liked, but he got a deal that nobody could argue with, which I think was the case with Harper. Um, you know, Manny Machado had Dan Lozano as an agent. So like he had the same winter or similar winter. And so it's not just a specifically Scott Boris thing, but it is these long uh, protracted negotiations are probably his signature more than anybody else. But perhaps I think, you know, maybe that's, you know, maybe he's popular among some players, uh, very unpopular among other players. I'm sure he's unpopular among certain owners to where like, you know, they don't mind necessarily nudging um, some anti boris sentiment in the player ranks too, to where like, yeah, just, you know, let's, let's start that fire. And, you know, just, you know, you know just flick, uh, flipping a, uh, a bick into the pile and be like, whoa, flames. Uh, that's kind of what struck me uh, based on just the way they're taking shots at Boris and how he got lumped in uh, because it has been, I think, a pretty bad winter for him. Um, he, he's had winters where like, oh, you know, he probably overplayed his hand before, but this one seems like one where it actually did result in multiple sub-market deals and well under markets uh, when it comes to uh, years. Yeah, we're a week away from opening day. Jordan Montgomery still hasn't signed. And the Texas Rangers just signed Michael Lorenzen to their starting rotation. So theoretically, that 
removes one more team in the market for Jordan Montgomery, there's still a part of me that's like, the White Sox, go sign Jordan Montgomery. He'll be ready by mid-April. Like, why not at, at this point? Just Because Brad Keller looks good. Uh, we're going to get to that. We're going to oh, be previewing uh, the White Sox starting pitchers and catchers soon. I, I think but an important ahead. context for people to understand is, like, uh, who Harry Marino is. Because, you know, the, the criticism of Boris, essentially, and a lot of, like, the players' union leadership has been, like, the superstars. And the criticism of kind of having Boris having a lot of influences at it is that's kind of viewing – economic advancement of players through, uh, you know, the top players getting paid and kind of this kind of made me almost like trickle down uh, kind of philosophy. So on the other end of the spectrum is Marino, who people might remember if, you know, they remember my like long obscure investigation about minor league housing, used to run advocates for minor leaguers, um, which was a group that raised a lot of attention to treatment and conditions of minor leaguers and probably built a lot of allegiances with those guys who are in the minor leagues who are now advancing towards the major leagues and make up a lot of, a lot of the youth population of the sport. And alongside that, he became you know a major force in the minor leaguers, successfully unionizing and then joined the players union. So a lot of like these one to three guys who are going to make up like a big majority, right as you know a lot, a lot of the senior leadership stepped down um after the last cba they're kind of aligned to this like idea who somebody who was really like kind of empowering for them or uh you know had built a relationship with them before they joined the union and they have the, maybe this different perspective from the kind of more established union leadership uh, guys who have been the majors and guys who are kind of viewing their you know economic justice for players in maybe a different way uh and, and not as you know, bottom up as Marino and that camp would be. Yeah, especially if like the the dollars aren't going to the top players or the stars as much as they used to, then the focus does turn to well, uh, years one through three or years one through six really have to uh, be an emphasis point of emphasis for the next CBA in order to try to make sure that they're not losing uh, the revenue share that they had. And we had that conversation during the lockout, Jim. Like the focus of the players association, so much of it. As James pointed out, it's like very to the top. Like next year's Juan Soto, right? He's the big free agent and he can make maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in a new deal. And I say maybe because I thought Blake Snell was going to be making hundreds, hundreds of millions and he didn't even come close to that. Uh, but if you're not going to get there, like you reference Evan Marshall in the past, if that's the majority of your association now. And the tie turns where it's like, we really need to focus on the guys from years one through four because the average career is not seven, eight years. It's much shorter than that. And if teams have this active loophole in the CBA where someone like J.D. Davis is going to get more than $6 million as an ARB eligible player can get cut and then they got to settle for a $2 million contract with the Oakland A's to continue playing Major League Baseball. I mean, yeah, that greatly impacts the bottom line. I, I can understand, like, if you're in bed as Tony Clark and Bruce Mayer with Scott Boris, you have some of the best players on your side that could maybe wield a lot of negotiating power, not just with owners, but with the Players Association as well. But as James pointed out, as the league gets younger and new faces are joining the association, they may not want to listen to the star players. They may just look at them like, well, yeah, you're the 1% and we're the 99%. And we need to focus a little bit more attention to the 99% than the 1%. So we really do need new leadership to start coming up with a new strategy because we can't have this type of CBA again after the 2026 season. So Jim, I already got it scheduled in my Google calendar, another work stoppage coming <laughs> December 2nd, uh, 2026. Cause I can't imagine the owners being cool with whatever would be proposed with this new angle, but I get why the players association's angry. Rob Manfred second then, right? Well, <laughs> cause he's still, he's still in charge right through 2027. Is it? Yeah. That'll be his last CBA. He negotiates yeah, so. his, his legacy, Jim his legacy. Uh, thanks to our friend in the YouTube chat. For those who listen to the podcast, uh, you would have already heard about this, but as we are live streaming, uh, and thank you, Tim, for that comment, but our, our friend down in Wellington, New Zealand, Shane, JD Martinez finally signs to the New York Mets for $12 million. So another free agent signing a week before opening day, people are finding jobs. So that's good. Uh, our next topic. So we shift over to the Chicago White Sox and 
Today was food day at Guarantee Ray Field. And uh, if you're going to games this year, and I've heard from many of you that you are planning to not go to any games this season. Those are usually the initial comments that I'm seeing on social media and Sox Machine about, oh, cool food. I'm not going to any games. But for those that are going to games this year, I hope you like sandwiches because it's a lot of new sandwiches that are going to be on the concession menu items this upcoming season, whether it's in the general concessions or up in the club level, the 300 level, or the stadium club suites as well. Uh, but James, you got to tag along with me for food day. What was... Uh, what was your favorite food day item? Um, I mean, I think I could be a simpleton and say like the milkshake was good because it was a milkshake. Uh, so that was that was a, what, what was it? Campfire milkshake? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, the s'mores. I don't remember milkshake. the full yeah. title. They're always like some extra level of extravagance. Uh, as a like <laughs> person who like works there eighty one times a year and like tries to winds up eating dinner there like probably 20 or 30 times and, and tries to not like make that add up in some way that like shaves 20 to 30 days off my life. Um, <laughs> I was like, I was optimistic about the empanadas. They were not like elite empanadas, but they were like, these are workable empanadas. And that's like a different thing than just like eating a burger or a deli sandwich. Like every time I go down, um, I, I felt like it was a good change of pace. I didn't, I only got like the spinach and cheese one, but like it was like, Instantly, just having an empanada full of shredded spinach is just like such a such an enormous increase on the number of vegetables I usually I like, consume at a ballpark when I like go down to the hundred <laughs> level. That like I feel like that can only bode well. Uh, I you know, yeah, it seems like they're set on a slogan for the season with better at the ballpark. But like twenty twenty four White Sox eat your vegetables. I think would work pretty well as well. Um, <laughs> I'll I'll send it to uh, some some people and see what traction it gets. Yeah, yeah, better at the ballpark, Jim. That is the slogan for the 2024 White Sox. White Sox baseball, we're trying to get regular. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, better at the ballpark. 2024 White Sox. Don't watch us on TV. <laughs> Just come to Please. the ballpark. Yeah. Uh, the one I was intrigued by was the baguette style sandwich because like when it comes to ballpark food, like while all the helmet stuff and the, uh, the gluttonous stuff, you know, draws all the attention. Like I prefer what kind of food is, especially like say like during a rain delay where everybody's standing up under shelter, like what's easy to consume while walking or standing or like not causing a mess. And like baguette sandwiches are like perfect for that. Cause like, you know, where do you get them? Uh, like when you're traveling, like, you know, train stations, uh, you know, sidewalk um you know or or like you know kind of storefront vendors where you're walking eating at the same time so any food that can be consumed on the move i think is what you want yeah the walking sticks those are very good i enjoy the roast beef one the most out of the three but yeah it's a lot of sandwiches it's a lot of sandwiches for white Sox food day the best item was the milkshake though the uh the milkshake was the best that i had and uh, again, you can go to SoxMachine.com. Uh, I reviewed it as far as the food items. We did get a chance to speak with the Chief Revenue Officer and Chief Marketing Officer of the Chicago White Sox, Brooks Boyer. James wrote up as far as our conversation with Brooks. So those are two things you could check out from our coverage of White Sox Food Day. Some really good insight of what's upcoming for the Chicago White Sox, with the exception that Brooks refused to answer my question. He gave me a little crap for not asking him any direct or controversial questions this time around, Jim, like I usually do. But he would not answer my question about what. when do you want to announce a new TV deal for the Chicago White Sox? I have no contentious questions for you because you are a coward. <laughs> <laughs> he refused. Uh, but yeah. he did address the security question, though. I was so. about to say, we asked about security, and he wound up telling us like kind of details of a report. So I was like, all right, that, that wouldn't yeah. be. That was the that was the one I was most worried about. Uh, well, that and does he really need a ballpark village in order to compete with the other teams? And the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. It takes a ballpark village to raise a ballpark team. In today's baseball, I guess, according to the chief revenue officer for the White Sox, they they are not backing down from that. No, they are not. They are very nice. And without saying like why they don't have one in their current stadium. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you have a neighborhood around your ballpark? Brooks, Jerry. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess that could have been my controversial question, but I'm going to save that question because next Wednesday night at the Remova Theater, we are having a live podcast along with our friends from the 108. And we're going to be having special guests joining us for this event. And again, doors open at 7 o'clock. Show starts at 8 o'clock. And one of those special guests that we're able to announce is the 11th Ward Alderman, Nicole Lee, will be joining me on stage. She'll be helping kick off the show, so she's going to be providing her insight, her perspective of what is going on between Bridgeport and the Chicago White Sox. So we're very excited to have Nicole join us. Again, that's our opening day eve show, Wednesday night, March 27th. Doors open again at 7 o'clock. The show starts at 8 o'clock. You can get your tickets at RemovaChicago.com. James and Jim will also be there as well. Uh, Lawrence Holmes, our best friend from Six Day with the Score, he'll be joining us as well as Courtney Finnecom from the Baseball Isn't Boring podcast, part of the Odyssey Network. They do a fantastic job covering Major League Baseball on a national level. So I'm very excited again that it's going to be next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, doors open. Show starts at 8 o'clock at the Remova Theater. I'm very excited for that event. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. It's true that some things change as we get older. But if you're a woman over 40 and you're dealing with insomnia, brain fog, moodiness, and weight gain, you don't have to accept it as just another part of aging. And with MIDI Health, you can get help and stop pushing through it alone. The experts at MIDI understand that all these symptoms can be connected to the hormonal changes that happen around menopause. And MIDI can help you feel more like yourself again. Many healthcare providers aren't trained to treat or even recognize menopause symptoms. MIDI clinicians are menopause experts. They're dedicated to providing safe, effective, FDA-approved solutions for dozens of hormonal symptoms not just hot flashes. Most importantly, they're covered by insurance. 91% of MIDI patients get relief from symptoms within just two months. You deserve to feel great. Book your virtual visit today at joinmidi.com. That's joinmidi.com. Now let's move over to previewing the Chicago White Sox catchers and pitchers for the 2024 season. So in previous episodes, before the Dylan Cease trade, we preview the White Sox outfielders, feel good about Luis Robert, hoping that Dominic Fletcher and Kevin Pillar can put together one more season, and we'll see about Andrew Benatendi. We preview the White Sox infielders. Maybe Yohan Makata can break out and have a four-war season, but outside of him, uh, who's going to step up in the infield? With the White Sox catching situation, Jim, with the White Sox sending Corey Lee to AAA, we're going with Max Stassi and Martin Maldonado. Not a surprise there. Going with the veterans. But it does raise some questions, especially with Martin Maldonado. And in the Veterans Committee Sox Machine group chat, which there are still spots available if you want to be part of our VC, you can reach out to Jim and I to apply. There's been really good conversation, really good questions about Martin Maldonado's ability to be still be a major league catcher. And spring training hasn't been inspiring, let's say, from Maldonado's effort. Other than the framing numbers, which have been awful for Maldonado in recent years, what are the other metrics that White Sox fans have to pay attention to early to see if Maldonado still has staying power to be a major league catcher? Well, uh, 
based on the way he was kind of boxing Garrett Crochet's pitches today, like pass balls could be one. Um, it was really odd watching the Royals broadcast and just seeing him like almost fighting um, what Crochet was throwing. And he had caught him in bullpens, but not in actual games. But uh, that was like a slightly worrisome and just had me thinking like, um, y- you know, my concern with Maldonado is that he's been with the Astros and like the Astros probably can make a lot of catchers look good just with the way they you know seem to have like great game planning up and down the organization great information flow to pitchers hitters etc uh that often leaves like other teams wondering like oh this is what it's really like to you know know what's going on uh versus you know teams like hearing about the White Sox and how they sometimes lagged behind college programs in terms of uh, what they knew about, you know, what other pitchers were throwing and such. So um, I I wondered based on the quality of their team, quality of information, like whether Maldonado, they could just carry him and he, you know, sure. He's a great game planner. He provides all the intangibles you want in terms of inspiring confidence, but everything else when it came to the guys throwing to him, the guys hitting around him in the lineup could all hide him. Even like when he was, his framing numbers, uh, you know, plummeted, like he still brought enough of that, uh, veteran presence to, you know, pacify everybody basically. And, and, and be happy he's there because everybody else is producing around him and everybody's more mad about Jose Abreu not hitting than Maldonado, uh, not providing much when he starts. Uh, so like, you know, when you take him from that, you know, very comfortable environment, and move him to the White Sox where like there will be no other bats masking his lack of a bet. Like the White Sox have like a top three or four in the order, maybe a five. And then you have like four, nine hitters afterwards. So like you, you skip right to the bottom of the order. Uh, So you have that going on. Then you have pitchers who struggle to throw strikes. So like they're going to need all the framing help uh, possible. Kind of reminded me of like Carlos Rodon throwing to Omar Narvaez before Narvaez got good at framing. And uh, yeah, Carlos's wife complaining about the strike zone. She's like, well, if he picked a better catcher, <laughs> maybe, you know, meet him halfway to, to frame, save some strikes for him uh, versus like, you know, getting comfortable with the guy who is not good at uh, receiving strikes. And then he got good after he left the White Sox. But like there are a whole lot of elements here to where like it could be, you know, ugly. And if it's ugly right away, like will the White Sox admit it or will they try to talk around it because they believe so much in it? Uh, like, he doesn't have, you know, he's got the reputation, like a sterling reputation around the league. But like, if you apply it to a situation that he can't help, um, yeah, I guess I- I'm curious how long the White Sox are going to be married uh, to the image of what he is. If like nothing is showing up or like the White Sox are so bad that what he does offer doesn't make a difference. Yeah, because it's the tangibles that we can't track, right, James, that the White Sox rave about the game calling the leadership, the things we don't have, quanti- we, we can't quantify those skills that Maldonado has. So I, I just feel like there's going to be some podcast episodes of the future in May, especially where Jim and I are just going to look at you and be like, why is Martin Maldonado still getting starts over Max Stassi? But it seems to be those two particular attributes, I guess, the pitch calling and leadership. I mean, how long can that really carry him to still being a major league catcher? I, mean, I think the idea of bringing him is that you're, you know, you're not getting production that's like tangible in any way. And I think it's kind of alongside, you know, the stakes of the season where, you know, ideally the influence that you think is going to be useful to a lot of young players long term shows up in the results in some way or in their performance. But also if it doesn't and you're just a, you know, we, hey, we sucked in 2024, but I learned a lot of stuff from Maldonado that I still use in my career. I think that's kind of like the useful outcome that they see out of it. But the way for that to become visually like unpalatable or just even functionally unpalatable is very easy. Like one, what if like Max Stassi, who obviously is coming off like a major hip injury, like, you know, beyond the whole, you know, actual reason he sat out last season. What if he like, he's played, he's played, he's hit like league average in the past. Like what if he's playing well and you're still using like Maldonado as your primary catcher as, as Griffo has initially plotted out to do. Like that can make that very, weird very quick or if like there's any legitimacy to like what Corey Lee has done in spring training he's playing well in triple a and you want to actually give him playing time and that seems like an actual developmentally useful thing to do this season then yeah that seems like it should it should give way in terms of Maldonado's playing time uh but how quickly you know someone like Pedro is going to move off of you know giving Maldonado a lot of reps how palatable that will be for Maldonado if they move him away from being the starting catcher 
right after he's kind of doing that same fight last year for a team that had you know World Series uh, ambitions. That all seems like it could be very complicated to navigate if, if the kind of plot for how he kind of gets phased out or maybe ideally isn't the primary catcher at the end of the year isn't something that's already been mapped out to him and you know he's on board with, uh, which I think it could be hard for any player to be on board with because he's obviously here because he thinks he can still play and, and can still prove himself as a full-time guy. Um, I, I did want to mention for it slipped too far away that um, one time in 2017, like Rodon was coming back from an injury and I just kind of made like this casual comment to Narvaez, like, Hey, you, you excited to see Carlos back? Cause you guys like work together. Maybe it's 2018. And he's like, yeah, sometimes I think I hear his voice around the hall and I like look around the corner, like is Carlos there? And then he's not. So I'm excited for him to come back. And I was like, I'm never questioning this pairing again. This is an intensity. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll get to. <laughs> so at that point, it's like this goes beyond strategy. So James, to follow up <clears throat> back to you about Grafal and Maldonado, because that is an interesting perspective that you bring to the table. Because last year it was Grafal and Tim Anderson, and how he would never drop Tim Anderson from the leadoff spot, except for to bat second, which completely missed the point of our criticism and understanding that one of your veterans is on the struggle bus that is impacting the entire rhythm of the lineup. But yeah, if, if Maldonado is like a negative war, negative one war player, which he could be easily by Memorial be. day, easily could be by Memorial day. And he's getting 60% of the starts, but Grafal says, ah, I don't care about any of that. That's for the nerds, or that's for everybody else that goes on the internet. I never go on the internet, so I never look that stuff up. Like, doesn't... Meanwhile, Pakoda. Yeah, except for Pakoda. <laughs> doesn't this, like, again, like, I feel this particular player and the way that he manages Martin Maldonado is another opportunity for risk for Pedro Grafal to demonstrate that he might be over his head drowning here being a major league manager like i am concerned about how he divvies out playing time because if he's 50 50 to start the season i'm okay with that james between stassi and maldonado but at some point if stassi's a league average hitter you got to move forward with stassi don't you yeah i mean another converse like scenario could be like obviously he looks really out of sorts with crochet today and i don't know if that's like well plus deception for crochet or or what but you know, if you're getting, if you're into the season where half the offense isn't hitting and Crochet and Estrini and other, a couple other guys are like swearing by Maldonado or like saying that like they work with the best and want to mm-hmm. work with the best. And yeah, I think Grafolda could turn around. It's like, why is this the one element of their offense we're like pissing Ammonia at? Like, we're developing these arms. We're teaching them how to go navigate through games. Like, we're, you know, already scratching together, rubbing together sticks to score two runs per night. Like, is it really worth it to take this extra step just to try to get like a little bit better bat from like a non-offensive position already? Um, The stakes of the season could make it seem, you know, not, not super functional, not super vital to, to move out of a guy. If they can, if if you have people like actively touting uh, the mentorship uh, aspect, which, you know, pitchers are pretty, they readily do that. I mean, I can, dig up old quotes of people saying nice things about like your means catching from back in spring training. Like pitchers are going to testify and speak well of the guy that they're working well with or they're working with and, and going to war with every day. And unless like things are really awful, um, it just, it's funny. Cause like, I'm wondering if what's the way to tangibly show the impact of somebody whose impact we know is only going to be intangible. Like, what what way have can yeah. pitchers really speak to like how he's improving them, uh, other than just like he told me to throw a fastball and I was scared of him so I did it and it worked. So like, God, are we gonna get those kind of anecdotes? Yeah, it's consistent with like the philosophy like behind the team. Like, if we're gonna lose, it's not because we're throwing to the wrong base or it's because we're not like covering ground. It's we're gonna lose because we just don't have the offensive talent. In this case, like. If we're going to lose, it's not because our pitchers are receiving wrong information or they, you know, you don't have a catcher who knows like how to manage emotions or like even manage like the umpires behind the plate. Like, you know, just there, it's a very conservative approach of just, uh, you know, trying to minimize mistakes and, you know, maybe improve like the 
information and just the way pitchers are processing the game like that seems to be kind of make me the through line is like we want our defenders processing the game faster we want pitchers processing the game correctly you know we want them to have confidence and do things decisively kind of like the whole fast thing but for pitchers um and you know maybe that's true but like yeah i'm thinking about like if crochet or nastrini talk about like you know uh, yeah, I'm really throwing well from Maldonado. Like, how would they know they just got here? Like, when it came to the role and how many innings they've thrown, like, you know, try swapping them out. Like, it's one thing, I guess, like if Lucas Giolito and James McCann form a pairing because, like, Giolito's thrown to enough guys and he's had some struggles, he has he's had some ups and downs. Like, he might know the difference. But when you have this many young pitchers or pitchers who are coming off injuries and you know coming from the kbo like all sorts of a variety of um experiences that aren't standard major league fair um they really don't have the healthiest base of comparison to really like make um decisions around and i guess we saw like Griffold tip this a little bit with Corey lee last year talking about like i don't care what he hits i want to know how he's defending and like you know maldonado will test that but i think like it's going to be a case of like if his framing numbers like if last year wasn't aberration or it's just some kind of weird calculation of like a part of his technique that he fixed and like all is better on that front. If he is like league's worst framer, uh, you know, one of the league's worst hitters, one of the league's slowest players. And then like your the staff ERA is like five point something like, you know, when do you, and, and say like Corey Lee's hitting well, or Adam Hackenberg looks like a credible third catcher, maybe a second catcher. If you push him in that role, um, you know, that's, I, I think they're, you know, fortunately with the White Sox, the way they've accumulated some, you know, interesting catching depth at AAA and probably AA too. Um, you know, you don't have to stick with Maldonado if you don't have to. It's just a matter of like whether with the way they're stressing like information and processing the game, like whether they feel like they have to be married to Maldonado because like he's the only guy they trust to do these things correctly with Max Sassy, Jim, what are the, what are some reasonable expectations for him? Cause again, he missed all of last season. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you have that and you have like the whole, um, you know, I, I liken to James McCann who had his own terrible season after his twins are born premature. And you just have like, you know, they're banking on the, the, the dad catchers who had been through hell and you know, everything that comes after, you know, now once they're, kids are healthy and, and, you know, you can, you know, have some stability at home. Like everything else seems lighter, like hitting a major league slider is all of a sudden a lot easier when you're not worried about the health of your kid every day. So like, maybe that's kind of like what they're going back to the well here. Um, but does that work for you as a dad? Do you write better? Do you podcast no, like, better? Yeah, I can't relate to these guys. Like, you know, we, you know, we were lucky to have like a healthy, normal pregnancy, but like one thing about, you know, uh, one thing about being a dad, like here's where I'll, I'll do the the high horse thing, but no, just what, yeah. like being a guy, like you don't hear all the horror stories until like you have a reason to hear. Like I have a fair number of you know, female friends who have been pregnant and such. Like I hear like all the good stuff, but then as soon as like my wife got pregnant, like now here comes the bad stuff or here comes like what she'll be going through. Here's what everything you have to worry about. And, like, you know, you don't hear about that as a guy. So like, you know, my knowledge of just like the range of outcomes uh, really broadened, uh, over those nine months. And so like, yeah, yeah. I was extremely fortunate to have a, you know, on time, um, you know, just everything hitting all the marks, uh, type of pregnancy and, and childbirth, everything like that. But yeah, you hear some horrible stories. So you got to tip your hats to them for like, you know, being able to actually go to their jobs or in the case of Stassi's case, like realize he can't because it does take a toll. So yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, compelling. There's also like, you know, the hip injury too, which is, you know, given how he's had a slow start to his spring, like, can he get all the way back? So I think if he gets all the way back, like I would say, like, if it's like an 85 OPS plus, like I'd say like, that's probably okay. If he's framing like he was and the defense is there, but yeah, there are a lot of variables here to where like, you know, maybe he'll be an okay hitter, but the defense erodes on him because like his hip, it, you know, causes some problems or changes in technique behind the plates that, that really creates some issues for him, like being able to uh, receive the ball, or maybe he's just getting older and that's some, that's a skill that declines. So there are a lot of, you know, balls up in the air, I think with Stassi's game to where like, I think it's worth the flyer the White Sox are taking, basically paying him the league minimum to uh, see what he has left. Um, but yeah, it's, but between Maldonado and Stassi, like, you know, there is a high bust rate here of just like, 
the White Sox taking a flyer on a guy who you know has demonstrated all the skills to be a successful catcher for a successful pitching staff. Um, but yeah, they're just it's you know, I think we know what Maldonado is going to do or not do. I think Stassi, it's a lot uh <laughs> there are a lot more crazy variables going on. So I would say like 80, 85 OPS plus with the occasional homer and like average defensive metrics would kind of be, I think, maybe the slightly above average outcome based on just, you know, how he might not be able to show up to the post of like his hip still bothering him, or if he's just you know missing a year really uh, just kind of accelerated the, the decline that he was already kind of battling a little bit. The Chicago White Sox are to celebrate Father's Day, uh, which Father's Day this year in 2024, June 16th, the White Sox will be visiting the NL champions, the reigning NL champions, the Arizona Diamondbacks, uh, for that day, Father's Day. They'll be celebrating it against the Boston Red Sox the 7th to the 9th in that weekend for those making plans. Uh, Hawaiian Shirt Day is that Saturday afternoon uh, till between the White Sox and Red Sox. I would like... If there's that opportunity, Max Stassi, to start that game, I don't have a lot of requests for this year. I I would like John Brabia to close out one game at home so I could hear Wham. Uh, I think it would be a really cool moment, especially for Max Stassi, if he gets a chance to start that game for the White Sox and if his son is able to attend. I just think that would be a really cool, a, a good emotional moment for someone that went through so much in 2023. I find myself rooting for Max Stassi to have a good season because I know we don't talk a lot about him. Whereas in Marti Maldonado, I, I'm, I, I don't know. He's got a lot that he needs to sell to me <laughs> because I think we're just going to spend so much time arguing with Pedro Grafal, Jim, this upcoming season. Well, forget all these advanced metrics. Let me tell you what he's doing well. And being like, Pedro, no. The things that you point out, we can track. And let us tell you, he's not even doing those things well. Yeah, Maldonado, his, you know, he's basically made. Like, his legacy is secure. And now it's just a matter of, yes. like, how many more years he has. Whereas Stassi's had some ups and downs and some interruptions. And so, like, you would like to see him, like, you know, be able to have at least, you know, not, um, you know, terrible off-field, you know, trauma, basically. And then, like, a hip injury just kind of combined to cut what was like a underappreciated type body of work and, and kind of skill set, um, you know, be cut short. Yeah. We'll, we'll still see Corey Lee this year, White Sox fans. Uh, Cause you, you need three catchers. I mean, Maldonado Sassy, they could easily go on the injured list. So we'll see Corey Lee. I think he's the man, next man up for the White Sox of the catching side. We talk so much James about Colson Montgomery and Brian Ramos, like preserving their 45 days so they could still be eligible rookies next year. Is Edgar Caro on that radar or is he still too far away from possibly seeing him in September this season in Chicago? I think it's a possibility. I don't think it's the same way where you map it out with Colson and, you know, seemingly the only way it doesn't happen is is health. Like he didn't conquer, like he, he held ground at double a last year. He didn't conquer it. And you know, we kind of want to see the way the offensive skill set plays against, you know, upper level pitching. Cause we haven't seen him necessarily thrive against anything above a ball and you know, he kind of got rushed last year in some weird way that I don't really understand the motivations for. Um, the Sox sent him back to Birmingham when they optioned him, so I, I don't think they see him as like on the doorstep. I, I, I think you need to see him really kind of dominate Double A pitching. Um, they they really felt he kind of wore down at the end of last season, and it wasn't it was kind of short of the ninety games caught threshold. So. I think that's another reason they'd probably be a little cautious to call him up is that, you know, likely when you're considering it, he's probably already going to be nearing his, his career high. And in that case, you kind of got a situation where maybe you call him up in September, if you have the roster spots for it, just to like experience, you know, maybe Maldonado's still around, maybe he's on the IL, maybe it's good experience or exposure either way, but then people are maybe shrugging their shoulders and going like what WTF when he only starts like four or five games, but it's really that he's, not conditioned to really you want to stretch him and major the the hardest games he's ever played in his life when he's already you know 15 20 games above his previous career high for catching so i think he's probably i think you definitely want to see him take over that job at some point during the 2025 season but it doesn't necessarily require him to debut during this season to accomplish well let's move over to the white Sox starting pitchers and this is going to be more of a brief conversation because I think we're just going to be talking about the starting pitchers a lot this upcoming season. And 
This is on how it's mapped out right now for the opening day series against the Detroit Tigers. Garrett Crochet is going to be the opening day starter. We joked about it in the last podcast episode. Why not? Let's get crazy. And uh, Pedro Grafal said, sure, let's run with it. So the White Sox are going to roll with Garrett Crochet. He made his uh, one of his last starts of spring training earlier today. He threw 80 pitches. Uh, Garrett Crochet did in his spring training start. Only lasted three and a third innings. That's kind of the concern, but he threw 80. Uh, so let's see in how he recovers from that performance. Uh, Mike Soroka will take the ball in game two on Saturday. That's the scheduled game against the Tigers. That is a 1.10 p.m. Central Time start, by the way. And then on Sunday, it's Eric Fetty, the new guy. He'll be the White Sox number three starter to start the season. So that's your first three. We still haven't gotten confirmation from Pedro Gafal and how the rest of the rotation is going to be, but we are projecting that'll be Chris Flexen and Nick Nestrini to roll out the rest of the White Sox starting rotation. But there is the talk about how the opening series is going to roll out, and at least at home stand, because the White Sox next series is at home against the Atlanta Braves. And how this uh, pitching matchups will work, especially with Garrett Crochet learning on the fly and trying to be a starting pitcher. And there, it comes to this tweet from Daryl Van Scowen of the Chicago Sun Times. Uh, speak with Pedro Grafal today. Grafal said the White Sox will need a fifth starter on April 3rd against the Braves, the White Sox sixth game of the season. Opening day starter Garrett Crochet would pitch on four days rest on April 2nd, but day two starter Mike Soroka would be on three days rest on April 3rd and will pitch April 4th at Kansas City. Uh, James, can you possibly translate what Pedro Grafal is trying to convey here and how the White Sox first two series and the first run through the rotation will look like? So you have the off day right after Crochet makes the opening day start. So Crochet now has this extra day of rest, but everyone else is essentially on rotation. So when you get to the fifth starter slot, you have basically Crochet fully rested and you can use him again, but you can't just skip the fifth starter slot because no one else has gotten that extra day. So thus, you have to have your fifth starter there after Crochet and then go back into your uh, your normal rotation, two, three, four. Uh, the thing is, like, why is this super necessary? Like, are you that eager to skip your fifth starter? Um, does it is it allow you to, if, say, the fifth starter is Nick Nostrini, not break camp with him, and thus you have an extra arm for an extra couple days. Is that super useful? Um, is that with Crochet, you know, this effectively has to be his last outing that he had on Monday because it's only a week until another day. He can, he can throw, he can stretch out a little bit, maybe, you know, throw a couple up downs, but you can't have another full start to build him up. Is, you know, he's going to be, you know, especially since they're already kind of thinking him as someone they're going to really monitor the innings of be surprising to see him throw more than 90 pitches like in his first start and you're still kind of building up. Do you really want to keep him on regular rest? Or maybe is that part of it just that he's not used to having extra rest and throwing off his routine anymore? Uh, kind of an extra little, you know, uh, messing with his head or messing with his routine in a way that uh, is not easily recoverable. Um, the other thing is like, doesn't the, I guess they can work it out as far as like crochet going next or the fifth starter going next, but just, it seems like an odd wrinkle to assess. And the only thing benefit I can really think of is that, you know, you, you get an extra bullpen arm uh, before you use Nostrini or whoever um, by the extra day. And um, if anything, we're kind of looking at this White Sox group and seeing how we count to eight. So seeing how they get to nine will be, uh, you know, informative. Yeah, they, he doesn't have an idea yet who's still in his bullpen a week before opening day. So that the, whoever's in his bullpen, I mean, that's one story in, in itself. Uh, we did get this comment in the YouTube uh, chat and live stream. We don't even know if Crochet can handle five days rest. And this is, I guess, where I, we, we had our reaction on SoxMachine.com. And Jim, push back if I'm going too far with this. I think... The crochet's opening day start goes one of two ways. It's either encouraging or embarrassing. Encouraging in which that he can get through four innings and maybe he allows just one run. But for 60, 70 pitches, you could see the path of crochet being successful, whether that's an extended opener or a starting pitcher that can go five innings from you for you. The embarrassing part 
is what happens if he repeats last year where he faces 20 Tigers batters and cap tip to Tigers media for pointing this out. He walked seven out of the 20 batters he faced against the Tigers last year. He walked seven of them. So what happens if he has a Yamamoto type of star, which Yamamoto, all that money lasted one inning against the San Diego Padres. The reason I say embarrassing because everyone else in major league baseball, when they check the out of town scoreboard in their broadcast, will say, Oh, the Tigers beat the White Sox earlier this afternoon. And did you see what the White Sox did on opening day? They used an opener. What kind of team are they fielding? They don't have they don't have someone that can throw five innings. They don't have enough starting pitchers to start the season. Now that might be out of town stupid, and we could maybe claw back or push back from that commentary outside of Chicago, or at least in the south side of Chicago. But I would find that criticism to be fair of what the White Sox strategy is here on opening day. So how do you feel about Crochet next week being that opening day starter and how the rotation can look like at least through the first homestand? Yeah, I can I can kind of see that in terms of like, yeah, there there is the possibility of just like a – I mean, we've seen White Sox opening day start duds. Uh, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's a miserable openers to where like even, you know, guys who are supposed to go six, seven innings only, you know, get, you know, got knocked out in the first couple. So like, yeah, I think it's an unfair standard a little bit to like hold crochet to be like, if he screws up, it's because he's uniquely flawed as an individual. And this never should have happened because the White Sox just have a way of like immediately face planting out of the gates um, and, and, and making everybody feel like, well, you know, what are the other 161 going to look like? So like I'm, you know, I think I will probably be the um, moderating force in uh, among the two of us in terms of like trying to bring it back to the center and say like, oh, let's, you know, build up a few more starts to kind of see what the consensus is. But yeah, just, you know, my read on crochet, like watching him today and just being like, well, you know, you don't know if his breaking balls work. You don't know like if his secondary line of, uh, attack works like we know he can he's locating the fastball better to where like i don't think walking the ballpark will be a problem i think the problem will be if like he's only getting his fastball over or if his fastball is the only strike that gets swings and misses like in the zone or like turn into strikes um you could see like either really long at bats that end in singles and he just like ends up throwing three innings because he's already at 80 pitches or just the second time through poses some real problems for him so like you know, having watched him in the desert, uh, being like maybe not the greatest environment for like his secondary pitches, but also like he just might not be somebody who has secondary pitches, uh, plural, <laughs> to where like you know he's somebody yeah you know, that it's a really it's a term for those kind of guys. <laughs> so like it's a it's a pretty grand experiment here in a lot of ways, and you know my thought was like I hope yeah and and yeah taking it back to gambling up top, but like he may never qualify for a win. Like if he's at like 80, just like he's somebody who could just be like, Oh, and 10 or like have the Dylan Cease Canapolis record, like one in you know 11 or something like that. Just because like you get saddled with all the losses when he leaves while trailing. But like when he's ahead, like he may stop at four and a third because like he's already 75, 80, they're managing it. So like he's somebody I think who could use an opener just to allow him to pick up a win every once in a while. If it turns out like he's not able to go five with the lead all that frequently. Yeah. Again, the whole embarrassing angle would be on how everyone else nationally, Jim, talks about the White Sox. Like, that's how they would point out, be like, I can't wait to circle the White Sox series on our calendar, uh, especially if they don't have enough starting pitchers to have one on opening day, where we would say, I mean, they're trying. They're, like, trying to figure out if Crochet could be a starter. Again, I don't think he will be, because to your point, like, the secondary pitches – We'll be again. We'll be previewing opening day coming up. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot. There's so many questions. He may throw 80 pitches and 70 of them are fastballs. Let's see how good the fastball really is uh, against the Detroit Tigers. But it's flexing and Estrini, right? J- James, is that what we're rolling with their projection? I know I said that earlier. After them, who's next? I guess because the the question I have for both of you is that over under 12 and a half different starting pitchers this year for the Chicago White Sox. Now, I don't think I could name 13 starting pitchers right now for the White Sox, so I'm inclined to go under. But Jim pointed out before we went on the live stream that Pedro Gafal is talking up Brad Keller. 
could Brad Keller surprise and make the opening day roster at the last minute? I, I don't think so, just because like he's only throwing two innings still. I don't think they expect him to be built up that much uh, by then. Um, okay. So I, I think that's something like ready as depth as uh, time you know necessitates, and you know they could easily use him as a way to skip. Uh, crochet a turn as I'm sure they'll do at some point um, if they had that level of free will over how everything goes. But um, I think Woodford is a multi inning option, someone you could stretch out and not really feel super bad about, uh, you know, throwing him and trying to get multiple innings. Chad Cool has obviously done it a lot before where it wouldn't be like the craziest spot start situation uh, of all time. Um, but I, I think you obviously need a lot from triple a to kind of develop into a reasonable options over the course of the year. Um, you know, Davis Martin becomes obviously something at the all-star break that could be very useful for when he's ready. Um, theoretically, Jared Schuster is, is probably in that mix or at least can be, you know, triple a rotation looks a little gnarly as well. Um, Drew Sharp obviously becomes somebody who, you know, he didn't look super like immediately ready. Um, the first time we saw him, but it's supposed to be someone who you would think they could feel comfortable starting in triple A or at least even if he's in Birmingham to start, not be someone they would rule out, you know, coming up and having him be a spot spot starter for however he's gonna be. Like the thing that gets touted from the first day you acquire is that, you know, um Sharp was somebody who was in consideration to make San Diego's Drew over Thorpe. Oh, yeah. Drew Thorpe. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why you call him Drew Sharp. Uh I think that's a cooler name. Um, he was a Detroit news columnist. Right. Uh, Big Eater, if he ever got right, would obviously be someone you could make the majors pretty quickly, though, seeing him like have the level of control where you really feel comfortable with him every five days uh, feels a little projective. So um, Kai Bush would be in that mix as well. There's, there's a lot of like maybes, um, especially with Getz also suggesting Erie RT can make it, but I I'm very on the idea that like um, Flexen would hold down a rotation uh, spot all year because I'm like trying to develop as many puns as possible. Uh, I've been I've been talking with old friends, uh, flexual healing, flexual mm-hmm. eruption. Uh, I want to flex you up. Uh, <laughs> flex lies and videotape. Uh, flexi beast, masters of flex on the basis of flex, uh, flex appeal. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot. There's a long season to kind of work these up, and I, I think <laughs> making 30 starts is really the only way I can get all of them in use. Yeah, all right. I love that for you. I love that journey. Can't wait to see those headlines at SoxMachine.com uh, during the season. Last year, 11 starters, Jim, for the White Sox. They had 11 different guys make starts for the White Sox. So if I asked you over under 12 and a half starters for the White Sox in 2024, you take it the over or the under? That makes me say under, but then you look at, you know, who took those starts like cease, obviously like, you know, he doesn't miss starts. So like, he's somebody whose spot you never have to worry about. He's gone. Uh, you know, Clevenger missed a little bit of time. G Lito and Lynn were traded. Also, they tend to miss time. Um, so like cease was like the only beacon of stability in the rotation and they got to 11. So now that, you know, so maybe 12 and a half seems a bit high, but like, I could, you know, I was going through the list. So I had Crochet, Soroka, Fetty, Flex, and Nestrini. Then you go to Toussaint, uh, Schuster, Thorpe, Iriarte, Martin, Cannon, Bush, uh, Keller, Cool, Woodford, Eater. So that's like, you know, 15, 16 names. Not counting like the random guy like a Toussaint last year who they they picked him up uh, off the waivers and then he's making starts. Uh, you know, uh, Jose Arania, another guy who just you know made starts after you know being a, a waiver claim. So the White Sox did turn a couple of those guys you know from just random, and I think they'll be in random claiming mode again. I think there's gonna be a lot of turnover uh, to where like you could see just various cameos. So twelve and a half seems high, but I think like this would maybe be the year it happens because of either if they trade, uh, you know, they they try to uh, flip a couple guys at the deadline, or you know Soroka gets hurt again, and and then it's just a whole bunch of uh, trying not to embarrass any one individual by exposing them too much to starts and, you know, getting through 162 becomes like a really shared burden among like a, a, you know, more than a dozen individuals. So I think I will say over, but it does seem like uniquely high and like probably wouldn't do it again. (laughs) Or do not recommend doing that again. I love that the YouTube comment section is feeding James more puns. We got flexual dysfunction, Flexual chocolate, flex in the city. 
I, I thought about flexible chocolate. I don't know how to get it like in context, like in games, because some like things are really easy. He has a great start in San Diego, for example. Flex on the beach. He learns a new pitch. Flex education. Um, you talk about how cheap the rotation is. Flexible spending account. Um, <laughs> Stretch. <laughs> uh, he strikes out Jaime Candelario. Flex and candy. Like it's, it's, oh, it's a lot. So it's specific. Like <laughs> So like if 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 uh so if Candelaria gets an O2 count against Flexen and then fouls well off said. a couple of pitches and draws a walk, are we gonna hear like a pained scream from the press box? <laughs> <laughs> well obviously if he gets the O2 count, you're gonna overhear like onto the broadcast. I smell Flexen candy. <laughs> <laughs> then people are gonna be thinking you're gambling on it when he like he you know hit the O No, I just had a pun. <laughs> Don't investigate me. <laughs> Sean. And to come full circle, Sean's last suggestion. Flex bet. If he strikes out Otani. <laughs> Do you have flex seal on there? Flex who? Flex seal. Flex seal. No, I do not. I saw a boat in half. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. There's one All for right. free. That's that's going to be our running gag all season long, folks. Hit up James on social media. Hit up the, the comment section at SoxMachine.com. Give us your Chris Flexen puns that he could use throughout the season. And uh, I think that's going to be a great use of our time. But hopefully this podcast was a great use of your time for either watching or listening. Thank you so much again for watching and listening to this episode of Sox Machine Live. Again, one last reminder, we have our live podcast, our live show at the Remova Theater, Wednesday night, March 27th. Doors open at 7 o'clock. Show starts at 8 o'clock. We still have a few tickets remaining. You can get those at RemovaChicago.com. But that will do it for this episode of Sox Machine Live. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash Sox Machine for all of our videos. I've been posting up videos of MLB draft coverage as well of some of the top prospects as we get into conference play. An opportunity for you guys to see their highlights as well so you can get more familiar uh, with those types of draft prospects and of course the Sox Machine Live episodes and other videos will do please hit the subscribe button for our YouTube channel and if you don't get a chance to watch the video or if you just like listening to us in the car or on your commute on the train into work or into school you can always subscribe to the Sox Machine podcast wherever you listen to podcasts such as Spotify and Apple Music and of course follow us on social media or on all the platforms Twitter, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky we're at Sox Machine I'm at Sox Machine underscore Josh you can follow James at JR Feegan Sox Machine Live is a production of SoxMachine.com you're for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network alongside James Feegan and Jim Margulis I'm Josh Nelson thanks for watching and listening Every fan knows the right player in the right position can be a game changer. Put LifeLock between your identity and identity thieves to monitor and alert you to threats you could miss. Plus, with a U.S.-based restoration specialist on your team, you won't have to face drained accounts, fraudulent loans, or other losses from identity theft alone. All backed by the LifeLock Million Dollar Protection Package. Change the game on identity theft. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware.